We are going to be talking about transport and mobility and the various forms of transport, how we can make them integrated and work for all of our citizens down on the ground. Martha Thorne is your chair for this next plenary session. Martha Thorne, please come on stage and please bring your plenary session with you. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you. Please take a seat. Hello. Welcome to the main auditorium. And this next plenary session is all about mobility. Fantastic. Are we going to the third one? All right. If you are leaving the room, I am going to ask you to leave the room as quietly as electric cars. I.e., I should not be able to hear you out of respect for this plenary session. Martha, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to be here. As Femi just said, I'm Martha Thorne. I'm Dean at IE School of Architecture and Design in Madrid. I trained as a city planner, so it's especially uh, exciting for me to be in the company of these people today. We have with us for the panel discussion, Mr. Francois Bausch. He is the Minister of Mobility and Public Works in Luxembourg, and he has occupied that position since 2013. We have the mayor, mayor of Makati City in the Philippines. Welcome, Ms. Abigail Binet. And of course, Makati is the financial center of the country. We have Mr. Lanthina Kone. Uh, he is Director General of Smart Africa since March 2019. And prior to that, he was an advisor to the Prime Minister of Cote d'Ivoire. We're also, uh, we also welcome Mohamed Farjoud. Mohamed Farjoud is manager of ICT organization and the Smart City Tehran Center. And finally, from the private sector, accompanying our four public sector officials, we have Mr. Felipe Urbano de Saleta from FCC Environment. And with 30 years of experience in environmental services and waste management, he is now the head of business development, communication, and external affairs. For me, it's a challenge to moderate this because we have four very different settings, very different uh, cities, and uh, one private sector, but I will certainly do my best. And if I could ask the panelists to please take four minutes each, tell us a little bit about who you are and what is the greatest mobility challenging facing your city or in your, in your mind? So I'm uh, Francois Bauge, I'm Minister of uh, Mobility and Public Works in Luxembourg since 2013. I had the chance uh, to, uh, from the voters, to get a, a second period to work on mobility. It's not so easy to have this, but I'm really, uh, really happy about this because that allows me really to fulfill the strategy that we had to put in place in the last uh, five years uh, until 2023. The major problem that we have in Luxembourg is, uh, like in every uh, city, in every urban area, big urban area, a major economic hub in, in Europe, or I would even say in the world, is that uh, much jobs concentrated in the center of the country, uh, many commuters in the peak hours coming inside the city, and especially having an organization of the city based uh, totally, or had been based totally, on the private individual cars. We did in Luxembourg the same mistakes that we did everywhere. Uh, we, fought all, we fought during decades that we could resolve mobility problems by only uh, regarding or looking on one mode of transport. So the first thing is that we must really redefine the city and we go in a direction to see the city for the people and not for for example, for a car or for an infrastructure. And we must then completely start planning on a different way uh, our mobility, creating an infrastructure not to move, for example, cars, but to move people, uh, creating an infrastructure, no matter if it is a train or a, or a street infrastructure, really to, to move people from A to B. 
And that's a completely paradigm shift of what we had done in the last decades uh, nearly everywhere in the, in the world. The second point is that we have, there is no miracle solution. There is not a one mode of transport that will resolve our problems of mobility. We have to build on multi-modality. So really combining all the modes of transport that we have in our society. And the third point is I'm really convinced about that the public sector has an enormous role to play in the next 20, 25 years. Because we have, on one hand, the Paris Agreement on climate change, uh, CO2 emissions, where the transport sector plays an enormous role. <coughs> and on the other hand, we have more and more people, they want to live in urban areas, so we can't not anymore organize the urban areas like we did it in the last decades. So we have a window about 20, 25 years to change. And without major public investment, it is impossible to really to have this change. So that's the three, for me, the three major points. There is no miracle solution. You must combine, you must plan in a different way, and you must see that uh, the human being must be in the, in the middle of all this and not uh, an infrastructure, not an, another technology. So it's really co the conception of the city, the conception of the urban area must change dramatically. Thank you. I think you're going to have lots of questions at the end of this session, so thank you. Mayor Benet. Um, buenas tardes. I am the city mayor of um, the city of Makati in the Philippines. I have a daytime population of 5 million and a nighttime population of less than 1 million. So the biggest challenge for the city is one is mobility, the second is resiliency. We are also prone to floods, we are prone to earthquakes. So the city has to be a livable and resilient city at the same time. So in, 27, in 2018, we recently launched, we entered into a PPP with a, um, with a InfraDev company where they are going to invest 3.2 billion US dollars to build our 10 kilometer subway because we feel that the only solution to mobility and to traffic in the city is a mass transport system. This will be the first locally initiated public transport system that is free. Free meaning the government will not spend a single centavo to build um, this project and it is not a national project. This is going to be the city that will run its own mass transport system. So we hope to be able to accomplish this in 2025, and it will supposed to transport over 300,000 people on a daily basis and create 10,000 jobs for my city. So we don't have the same problems as Luxembourg, <laughs> but we are a very dense, uh, densely populated city. And the nice thing about our city is we are able to use technology uh, and introduce technology to make our lives better. Um, we are introducing technologies in the city where um, we built an, in our fiber optic in the entire city so we'll be able to give free internet and to interconnect all our facilities. And we recently launched our unified ID system that will be able to give us all the data that we need for our citizens. And the last one is our Makati Zen, it's, a, it's an app, integrating all the innovations that we will be introducing in the city. So we are a very small city. We are only 27.36 square kilometers, but we are the richest city in the entire Philippines. We have a, an asset of 4.5 million euros. Um, but the biggest challenge always is how do you address the needs of the city? We, the tendency is because we are a rich city, they gravitate towards the city. We have a lot of social benefits that we provide for our citizens. So hopefully we'll be able to address mobility and resiliency through innovation. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kone? Thank you. Uh, in the Smart Africa perspective, for people who do not know Smart Africa, it's a Pan-African organization comprised of a 30 country with over 750 million population in Africa. And uh, our problems are different than the, my two predecessors. Africa is the fastest urbanizing a continent on the planet today. Mm -hmm. And the Africa urban population has grown in a very high rate 
Back in the 1950s, it was growing at the 27%, and it's going to reach about 60% by 2050. The urban population in Africa will triple over the next 50 years. So differently from the two predecessor, we do not have any legacy. So the implementation and development of uh, smart city, it will be global thinking and a local context. What we may think it works properly in the Western world may not actually work in a city like in Nigeria, which is 21 million population. Our cities range from one city from 1 million population to 21 million population. So we see the challenges today here as really the investment deficit in terms of existing road, the road networks, and the fleets, et cetera. And we have a low quality of public transport. Because all of these occur because of the explosion of the population and the lack of the uh, public policy or the governance to be able to catch up with the growth of the population. We also have an increasing usage of the private cars because if there is a failure in the public transportation, what happens? The private sector will jump in even with individual cars. Also, low fare of revenues and increased operational costs. I mean, you may think that you know, they're really making money, but they're not really making money because the OPEX cost is too high. A non-sustainable transport system because it's all based on emission. And also, we have like a, a high accident rate. In Europe, for example, it's the 10.3 death per 100,000 population. In Africa, it's the 24.1 death per 100,000 population. So these are the challenges for that. Smart Africa came up with the uh, flagship project. In Smart Africa, we segmented the, the entire digital transformation into pieces of the puzzle. Each country actually conduct and lead one particular project. The Smart City project is led by uh, Rwanda. We did the concept node, we did the blueprints, and we also best practice sharing with the rest of the continent, with the rest of the country, and we did also a pilot project. Today, in Rwanda, today in Kigali, it's getting much, much better because there is an app today for traffic. There's also video surveillance. There's also a control center to control the traffic, how things are going. Nowadays, you know, even Volkswagen is coming up with the uh, motorbike system, motor, motorbike which works on electricity. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Right. Thank you. Mr. Fajud. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mohammed Fajud. I'm uh, the head of ICT organization <coughs> at uh, Tehran Municipality and also head of a Smart Tehran project. The, uh, the key challenges that we have in this big city, you know, Tehran during the night has uh, around 9 million population. During the day, it's about 12 million population living in this city. And uh, when you have this amount of uh, population in one city, for sure you have the traffic issue. Uh, and we have that. We have traffic and pollution as two key challenges of the city. Uh, to, to tackle the issues as, uh, of the city, it's about a year that we've initiated a project called the Smart Tehran. Smart Tehran has different uh, aspects uh, from uh, mobility to environment to safety and the others, but uh, always mobility has been as the core of attention in Tehran because people want the traffic to be solved. Uh, but from our point of view, of course, uh, apart from the uh, very important issues mentioned, uh, the, the way that we want to change the behavior of the uh, citizens according to the different modes of transportation they use is, is a challenge. So uh, we have created lots of highways and roads, and we have told them you need to use your cars, and they have adopted. There are lots of cars in the streets which will create the traffic. So uh, one of the challenges always is how to change this behavior and what kind of initiatives and projects we need to put in place uh, to handle this. So then we go to the next step, which is the regulation. I think uh, one of the challenges here is that how you want to use your regulation power in the city, like Tehran, to, to handle this. Especially when we are talking about uh, a city which is seeing lots of new technologies and new players coming for offering new modes of transportation. For example, during the past year, we had our first bike sharing services, or e-hailing and ride sharing is growing very fast in Tehran. Uh, just to give you an estimation of what is happening there, we have in Greater Tehran, which is the metropolitan area of Tehran, we have about one million rides per day 
of ride sharing and e-hailing services. So we need to uh, we need to have platforms of collaboration with these players who are not public anymore. They are private sector. Everything from A to Z has been done by the private sector. So you need to, to have plans for that. We have very good uh, experiences there in the past uh, year and uh, the, the change we are seeing in the uh, attitude of the city management towards these kind of things. For example, we uh, could finally reach the conclusion with these e-hailing companies to have a contract with us so there are some things that they will do and we will do in order to have better collaboration. Or for example, we opened city data a lot, especially on transportation and traffic data that we had to help the third parties and innovative companies in order to create tools for people to find their way through the city. So what I'm saying is that I think uh, it is very important now to use efficiently use the uh, uh, regulation and collaboration with the third parties and different players because they are offering different modes. I'm sure very soon we will have scooters and other uh, modes of transportation in the city. So we need to be prepared for that. And this is a challenge for us at the moment. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Urbano, <coughs> from the private sector. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I work for FCC Environment, as said. Our company has been delivering uh, environmental services for cities for the last, for over 100 years. We started here in Barcelona in 1911. And uh, today we serve nearly 60 million people in more than 5,000 municipalities all around the world. Um, uh, along this time, innovation has been always um, a driver that allowed us to be partners with uh, the cities and help them to, to be smarter, to become smarter. And, and focusing on this point of innovation, I, I, I'm aware that today the concept of improving mobility in cities is uh, today a fundamental topic when discussing policies for cities, even at national level, or also uh, in a simple day-to-day -day conversation between two, past two people. Um, from my point of view, I would like to bring this, uh, this matter, to focus this matter on electric mobility. Um, it's, it's something that is related to the public sector to creating uh, policies that allow it to develop. But electric mobility, from my point of view, uh, means a revolution in, 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 in cities because of its benefits on cities' environment and sustainability. Um, with no doubt, with um, electric cars or electric uh, means of transport, uh, we will get a uh, reduction of uh, pollutant emissions, noise emissions. Uh, we reduce our uh, carbon footprint. And, uh, and even we can save energy. We can be more efficient in terms of energy use. Uh, and, and I would like to bring the topic not just from the point of view of the private car owner, which today is facing a challenge on whether to switch to electric mobility or stay with, um, uh, with uh, thermal engines, conventional engines. But I will also, but I, will, I would like to, to bring your attention to the um, uh, public means of transport and uh, public services, which um, in general are carried out but very big vehicles which has a bigger impact on the city's environment. Um, just to give an example, uh, a private car um, along the day needs roughly from 15, 10, 15 kilowatts hour of energy. And on the other side, um, a heavy duty vehicle that delivers municipal services um, may consume nearly 800 kilowatts hour or 80 liters of diesel per day. So the transformation of those big 
municipal service vehicles into um, electric traction could be um, a very significant uh, breakthrough for the cities. That's okay. all, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's very interesting to me because all of you have spoken, I think, with optimism, but you've spoken about change. Let's dig a little deeper because change is not easy. Planning for people sounds wonderful. Uh, building new infrastructure is a great idea. Regulation uh, is one way to change people's behavior, but change is not something that comes automatically. So if, if each of you would, let's start with regulations. What can regulations do? Can they change behavior? Can they change the future of a city? And is that the most effective way to go? Especially the people from the private sector, which has an impact on the, uh, or the public sector, and then it has an impact on the private. So, and I have to admit, as we spoke before, the public sector is often very slow to embrace new regulation. It's often way behind uh, the private sector. It doesn't always have the tools to implement in a quick and agile way. So, regulation? I, I don't agree that the public sector in general is uh, too slow. That depends uh, of the political will that you have to change things. If it's clear, if you don't give uh, enough money uh, uh, to the public sector to, uh, to act and to really, uh, to really put in place uh, the, the, the change, so at the end it's clear that nothing will change. And regulation is, is important. But for example, it makes no sense if you, if you look at the discussions that we have now in, in many cities in Europe with air pollution. It makes no sense now to say, okay, we will now not allow any more to, uh, that cars enter into the cities because of the air pollution, if you don't have an alternative. And then you must ask yourself, why, you, why don't you have an alternative? Why there is no quality public transport? Why don't you have a metro or a tram that could be an alternative, for example, instead of using a car, using then the, the mass transport that you have? So it's a question also of prioritization in your politics. So the investments that you are doing, first you must have a vision, what do I want to finance? And then you must see the, the, the big picture. You must see that you don't have only cars or buses or trams. You have uh, pedestrians, you have cyclists who are important for the last two, three miles, for example. You have then the tram and, and the bus and, and the train and the car. You must have park and ride lots. And the you must create the possibilities to combine all this Possible, all these modes of transport that you have. So it's a question of really, how, what is your political vision as a political decision makers? How do you see the city and how do you see the mobility in the, in the, next, uh, in the future? I'm convinced that we cannot continue like we did it in the last decades because that cannot function anymore. That really uh, is not possible to organize city like this, cities like this anymore. It's, it's quite okay. interesting, you know, what the gentleman was saying. Yes, the public sector is very slow. But the thing is that, do you know some phenomenon becomes a solution for a certain problem in Africa, in the context? For example, I know the previous presentations, you know, we talk, they talk about taxis, they talk about Uber, they talk about any other, they're all cars. Uber in certain area work, in certain city work part of the world, Uber, yes, is not regulated, but in Africa, it solves a lot of problems. Unemployment, for example. So it only takes, it starts solving one problem until it becomes another problem. Then the government will jump in now to regulate to say, oh, you know, we can't really accept Uber here and so on and so forth. Today, young people, young people on the streets in Africa, they find this a huge opportunity. I have a car, I can make some more money because there is no other alternative. That's what I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fajul? Uh, yeah, from my point of view, uh, first of all, the regulations should support the strategies of the city. <clears throat> so it should be clear that what you want to do, then these regulations will come after that. If, for example, in Tehran, we found that we are not using that much the bicycle as a good mode of transportation. So the mayor put this as a strategy that we need to increase this, for example, not, not something very 
uh, I mean, dreamy or something like this, it's from 1% to 3% share of bicycle. So based on that, we have started some kind of regulation and also support <coughs> of the, those companies who are doing bicycle sharing. Uh, apart from that, these regulations should be so clear as well to the citizens. So when you put the regulation, you should make it clear for them. Maybe it is complicated from your side, but should not be complicated for them. For example, we had traffic zones. It was very flat at the beginning. It's very simple. You go there and you pay something. Mm -hmm. But when we started to adding more parameters to make it more fair, for example, if you have a car which is hybrid or electric, it will give you 90% discounts if you want to go to traffic zone. Or if you have a car with better, I mean, uh, quality, which low, uh, create less pollution, will give you discounts. Or things like this. But we make it all clear for the citizens, and then we added more parameters to have it clear. So regulation is supporting their strategy. What is their strategy? Less car in polluted areas, and less car in the areas that we have traffic. So this should be clear for them. Apart from that, uh, as I mentioned before, the collaborative regulation is necessary because city, uh, I mean, city councillors and city managers usually they are not expert in, in technology and things like that. So and usually we are behind. We are behind the, the technology. So technology is coming, new modes are coming, and then we will think about what to do. This is somehow normal in public sector. But the good point, the necessary point here is that how are we going to deal with this? So we need to sit with them, collaboratively decide about the regulations and what we want to do with them. We should not be a burden to them. We should help them if we are talking about third party. So this is something that we are all discussing, that uh, we cannot solve all the issues of transportation in the cities from the public sector. So this collaborative regulation is also a must. And uh, the last point is that we need lots of deregulation. At least in Tehran city, it is a must. So lots of previous regulations for, were for pass, as mentioned uh, before. Uh, from now till tomorrow, that we are talking about 10 to 20 years. Everything will be different in mobility of the cities. So our regulations are not supporting anymore this kind of innovations. And we need to have deregulations as well. Yeah. Madam Mayor, you spoke of new infrastructure uh, that would be free in terms of mobility. So that seems a way to encourage a certain behavior. Are there other measures or perhaps uh, regulations that you're thinking of imposing in your city that would help mobility? Well, because of the, the growing um, demand uh, and the increase in population in the city, you always have to think in advance. So uh, our discussion earlier, it, we will not use the word decentralization, but being able to give people the opportunity or the option to not use transportation, for example, um, telecommuting, um, doing online uh, transactions instead of having to go to City Hall, um, how to avoid long queues by being able to pay your taxes um, online or using a, a cashless ecosystem without re really having to go on the internet or going on a computer. Um, the, the problem with cities, especially mine, is when you have innovations, the policy and the regulation is usually um, outdated. So you always have to fight national policies. Even if you introduce local in innovations in your ordinances, if it is not allowed on a national level, then it becomes a problem. Um, in, in, in terms of transparency, in terms of governance, it's always easier to introduce innovations. You use technology to become more transparent. Unfortunately, because of the old laws, the old policies, we are unable to introduce this innovation. So you can only do so much on a local level. Um, but hopefully, we'll be able to convince on a national <coughs> level to adopt the policies that we, we would want. Um, but the reason why we want to implement this policy is because it addresses the concerns of our citizens. We have to have flexible regulation because the needs and the demands of our citizens changes every time. Okay, great, thank you. There was another comment talking about public-private partnerships. And this is an area that, that I find especially interesting because there is great promise 
private enterprise can innovate more, as you have said. It can bring new ideas to the table. They can be tested out in the city. On the other hand, um, sometimes, at least if we look to the past of smart cities, uh, private enterprise has tried to sell their product regardless of the priorities of a city. They've tried to convince cities to buy partial solutions when really an integrated si solution is needed. Is this changing? Should we be more optimistic about public-private partnerships or are there still pitfalls that you're experiencing either from the private sector or the public sector? Oh, well, um, um, uh, this is a very interesting point. Um, uh, coming from a private company, but even as an individual, I think that the um, public-private collaboration uh, brings many benefits to the, um, to the citizens, to the taxpayers. Um, um, it's true that the um, regulations and the conditions that rule the agreement between the public and the private parties on, on, on this collaboration must be very clearly set by the public sector. But, uh, and, and the public sector, the, the citizens' representatives, must very clearly define their needs. Uh, the more you define those needs, the more you research on the potential solutions on the market, and, and um, the more conditions you set for the private potential parties to cooperate with you, uh, you will be more comfortable in terms of getting what you really need, what you want and that nobody is going to sell you nothing that you don't need. Um, as a summary, bring me the best value for money. Um, deliver, I solve my problem the most effectively and, and in the most efficient manner. Okay. Um, in my four years of city mayor, I've had four big ticket PPPs. Uh, one is the subway, the other one is my fiber optics, one is my, the other one is my unified ID, and the other one is the app. I have no problems with my PPP as long as the terms are clear, the expectations are clear, and you know what you want. If, if you come from the public sector, yes, the, the private sector will sell you all these things, but you have to know what you want. And if you know what you want, they can't sell you anything. They can't sell you anything that you don't want to buy. So it has to be clear. You have to have a vision. I agree with um, um, that we have, the city has to have a vision. What, where do you want to bring your city? And you're supposed to use that as a roadmap and use that as your Bible. So the PPP, the, the private companies are supposed to help you get to the direction of your vision. Mm -hmm. But if it's not clear, then you'll end up buying something that you actually don't need. I completely agree on this because uh, it's clear that you, you have four actors in the society. You have the state, the municipalities, and even also the region in bigger countries, and then the citizens and the companies, and they must work together at the end to fulfill your vision. But first you must have the vision. You must see how do you want to organize your city, for example. A good example is the organization of the city is uh, the, the, the functionalities that you have in your city. Are they completely disruptive or are, or are you br really bringing them again together? When we organize our cities like we did it in the last uh, decades by having here the jobs and on at, at the other end uh, the, the housings, another hand the cultural infrastructures and then shopping again in another area so that it is nearly impossible to organize it by public transport and that, is it, so that you must use for everything your private car. So then it's impossible uh, that it can, uh, even with the help of the private sector, that cannot function. So you must have a clear vision how you will organize your city and then plan the mobility infrastructure uh, on this, in this vision. So at the end, uh, nobody can uh, 
decide for you as a public decision maker uh, uh, what will be the vision. And for, to have a good vision, you, you must also listen what the population is, is saying. The organization of our cities based mainly on private cars. That was not a, de a decision of the population. That was, that was a private decision. <laughs> that was an industry that really made that in the last 50, 60 years, the whole society had been organized only in the direction of one economic sector. That was not, no, not, not, not the decision of the population. So we must again listen what the population wants, especially knowing when you look at the, the statistics of the United Nations, knowing that in the next uh, 30, uh, 20, 30 years, 85% of the population in the worldwide, we live in urban areas. So, so it's clear that the model must change completely So what we are, what we are knowing today. We must really, really have an, get out of this tunnel view that we have today, we have a wider view again for how to organize the mobility in the city. Mr. Coney, is it possible to have a vision? It, it is hard. I, I think I, if I want to be the devil advocate here, isn't that killing the innovation if we need to plan for everything? I will give you a very simple example. People who, are, who knows about the mobile money in Africa by Safaricom in Kenya, if the cell phone operator had to wait for the government to give him authorization to do mobile money, it will never happen. Today, 60% of the government, of government GDP is, so. yes, 60% yeah. of the GDP yeah. is running yeah. on a mobile money. I'm just saying, government is playing catching up because we are all driven by the innovation. We talk about it today because some people have done it and it didn't work, and we think that we should properly plan for it. But most of the time, you don't know about the innovation. The private sector is driven by profit and by trial. Mm -hmm. It's only when they try in your city, then you find out it's creating another problem. You know what? Let me jump onto the regulation here. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying regulating, I was saying having an adaptive regulation as broad as possible and not make it rigid. Because if you make it rigid, today we're talking about scooter. We don't know tomorrow is going to be what. Absolutely. What about Tehran? Uh, yeah, about the triple P, I want to elaborate two things. One uh, is that when we are talking about partnership, uh, usually this goes to projects that say uh, there is an investment and then private sector comes and do something and the public sector also should support. But uh, I think a new, a par new models of partnership also is very important these days. For example, uh, as, as I mentioned before, when uh, there are players in the city that they are doing something that you've not been involved as the public sector, and uh, the citizens, as mentioned, they are happy with that and they're using that. So what, what, what is the role of the government now? What is the role of the city management? Uh, there can also be partnerships, but without being that much investment involved between the two parties. Uh, there, we need also new ways of approaching them. Because usually when the public sector sees something new, it's okay, we need to do some regulations there, okay? Yeah. But sometimes <laughs> you need to see the site, to let it be, and then the shape of the, uh, the, the, the methodology of, uh, after that will come. So sometimes you need to see the site, let it be. Of course, not that much when it is going to hurt some part of the society, but so the, it will be adapted to the society. This is one point. Another point, again, I, I will raise is the people. So it's 4P. When we are talking about public-private partnership, usually, again, the citizen is not included. So you, again, define you know, lots of new projects or, or uh, you, you implement them, but the, wh who, where is the citizen? I mean, do, do they need that? Do they want that? So in Tehran, we try to, to a little bit shift towards uh, deciding everything there at the top, at the, at the city council or the city management, and started to create tools and ways of engaging citizens more and more in decision-making process of the government, of the, the municipality. And we have more focus now on neighborhoods, doing lots of projects in neighborhoods, then the, and these projects is based on the priorities of the people who are living there. Why? Because when we are talking, trying to have some partnerships on projects, they also are a part of this partnership. So citizens, I think, should be added to the TPP model. Okay, great. I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to the public. 
Um, it sounds wonderful to plan for people. It sounds wonderful to be flexible. Um, mobility impacts many things. And even within mobility, there are priorities. So mobility for people, mobility. Uh, in the past, we talked about um, autonomous vehicles as the panacea. We've heard about electric vehicles. What is, the, what is the word for the future? Mobility related to sustainability, related to choice, related to variety, related to serving people, which people? When you think of mobility, please be more specific because it's very nice, mobility for people. Are there other problems that you're trying to attack through mobility? Is it economic development? What is, why mobility and for whom? And if you could resume, if you could give a brief summary and then we'll open it up to the audience. It's what, like what I said in the beginning, uh, you must combine the different possibilities of modes of transport or mobility that you have in the society. So one day, that dep depending on what you have to do, you may be used for the whole, uh, the whole uh, way that you have to, to, to to have mobility, you use the bike. Another day, you combine your bike with the car, or you combine it with a tram, with, with a bus, whatever. So combining, being open-minded, be, being flexible, the flexibility that we are needing. The, 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 the solution is, like I said, there is no magic solution. It's the combination between everything that we have at our disposition in the society really to resolve the problem. And then the organization of the city. The two comes to, must come together. You cannot, uh, also the technology, Te technology is a tool. Digitalization is a tool that can help us to, re to really uh, find uh, quicker solutions. But digitalization alone will not resolve the problem of Great. the mobility. Great. Mobility for what? Mobility to create an environment conducive for uh, living, for business. Um, I cannot have a successful or rich or happy city if it is difficult and, and you're stuck in, in traffic for over two hours when you just want to go home. So mobility is not about cars. Mobility is, is being able to walk home without having to get, not getting hit by a truck. <laughs> or being able to go, being able to walk without having to inhale all the pollution coming from the cars. Mobility is being able to come home not stressed because there's a lot of road rage, road rage coming from being <laughs> stuck in traffic. Um, mobility is have, you use mobility to have a better life. And you also said before to make a competitive city for yes. the economic development of your I city. I am a financial center. If it is so hard to come to my city, it's so hard to work in my city, they will just end up moving to another place where rent is cheaper, where it's easier to move, then that will be the, the demise of my social services. More than 60% of my taxes come from business tax. And they're, they're the ones that fund my free medicine, my free tuition for my kids, my, um, my free free hospital. So if I don't have these businesses in my city, I will not be going to be able to fund that. Thank you. Mr. Conan. In our view, mobility should define as the most optimum way of moving from point A to point B, because Africa is very diverse. What you may call optimal mobility here may not be optimal mobility in Africa. And for that saying, it should be driving by partnership, private, public, people, four Ps, because the government is too slow of making things happen. Great, thank you. Mr. Fajou. Uh, yeah, I think two points uh, were not that much mentioned uh, here, and I, I want to elaborate these last two points about my vision of the mobility uh, and future. One is the data. I think mobility will be much more data driven, and you need to use data. and. Uh, and, and, and this will change. It will dramatically change the, the way the mobility is uh, now and the traffic is managed, for example, in the cities. This is, is very important. Another thing which I think we need to take into consideration is the not everything should be mobile. I mean, uh, from that side, why should we travel in the city? 
So we need to think about the ways that we should decrease the necessity for travel. And the new generation is, is adopting this that much. You know, usually before, people will go outside to do things or to buy goods. Now the people tend to sit at home and the goods come to them. Huh? So it's, it's different. It's a different way of mobility. Previously, people were mo I mean, going to be mobile. Now goods are more mobile. So you need to think about these changes. The behavior, as I mentioned, is changed. And, if, and, and the data will prove to you that's which, how do you need to create the city which would tolerate this amount of mobility. Great, thank you. And Mr. Rano, briefly. Yes, very, very briefly, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, this is very easy to say mobility for people, but it's true. I mean, cities are made of citizens, inhabitants, and whatever you do is try to solve out their problems. They need to commute every day from home to their job. Uh, they need to live in a uh, healthy environment, so sustainability is very well connected to mobility. And uh, all the solutions that you put in place, that you set in place, uh, finally need to be affordable something that you can pay for. Thank you. We have three microphones, I believe. If someone has a question, I see one here in the middle. If someone would like to uh, approach the microphone, our guests would be willing to answer a few questions. Spanish, I think. Hello, thank you. Um, so we were talking before in another section at the mobility section, and we were saying that best, the best transportation plan is a land use plan. So I was wondering what your cities or is like Luxembourg, uh, Makati or cities in Africa uh, or Tehran have been doing to create better land use plans for the future because unfortunately I, I don't believe that if we land. just let the private sector uh, come in with uh, other solutions, they're going to create the best thing for the population. There has to be some type of guidelines, because now we're going to have exactly what you said, the, what, what happened with the cars that just ruined our cities. Yeah. Thank you. The, if you didn't hear, we have some trouble hearing. The acoustic is not good. Yeah. The question was uh, about mobility is related to land use planning. Land use. And what are you doing, and how do you see that in your own context? Yeah. So um, I was in Barcelona last June, and I was introduced to the concept of superblocks. So uh, the concept of superblocks is everything is within a block, so you don't really have to go to the other block. So if everything is situated here, you don't really have to use your car. Um, land use planning is very critical because you, the, cha the needs changes a lot. It changes frequently. So in, in the city of Makati, in the Philippines, we, we, are, uh, we have five years. Every five years, we check our zoning. We reclassify our zoning from a mixed use, from residential to mixed use. So you are, we are able to optimize the, the land. Um, and not, we're pushing more on a mixed use rather than a single, singular use of our land. I, yeah, I, I want to. I think if you take a street, a highway, for example, and if you see that it, in the peak hours your highway is congested, so the first solution should not be to say then, okay, we will widen and then build uh, two lanes more on the highway. The first question that you have to ask yourself is how many people are in the morning in this car? Is it one people f for one car, or are there two or three? Because you have five pl five seats in the cars. But normally, in the peak hours, you have one people in the car. So, because if you widen then uh, the streets, the highway, you use enormous land for nearly nothing, for, for being really completely inefficient. So the main question is, like I said be, at the beginning, you must really think your infrastructures by asking yourself, how many people must I move on this infrastructure? And then you have then to do something, maybe to favorize carpooling in the morning, in the peak hours, to say, okay, we may maybe put one lane more, but this lane is reserved for people where you have minimum three people in the car in the peak, or peak hours. Then you have a result. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, no, I think the key point here, uh, again, to coming back to that for, for the case, uh, is that uh, 
you need to, you know, the same we have here in Tehran, in, in, in my city, uh, the planning of the city has been based on other uh, I mean, parameters, other inputs. So uh, the change in the planning is a must for sure. TOD, for example, is one of the approaches that we are doing this so to change the way they have done the urban planning. But uh, when you see the traffic in the city, this is the results of these kinds of decisions that has been before. So uh, I do agree with my colleagues and, and support the idea that we need to have the new ways. Of, and this is the challenge that we have. It's like legacy that uh, this is a city. It cannot be, it will take time, but, but it's a must. Mm -hmm. right. Another question? Yes. Hi, um, Celeste from Garnet. Uh, I actually, I am from Venezuela. And there we have, uh, as many cities in Latin America and also in the States, uh, we have problems because the cities are uh, low dense. They are not very dense. So we need the car to move. What do you think will be the best way to solve this problem? OK. Did, did you hear her? Well, here's the, no density. Yeah. Okay, great. Who would like to, someone would like to respond? Maybe Mr. Kone, because I know Africa, the yeah, urbanization it is... is it's, very, very, it's a very interesting question, because in Africa, typically 63% of the population live in rural area. You have some low density area, for example, in Niger, where you have 12 people living per kilometer square. You have some city, there is no public transportation. What do you do? People use their personal cars. And it will take ages and ages because there is no interest in those particular areas. But we're really talking here about the urban area. Urban where the population, not everyone can actually. In a city like Abidjan and Ivory Coast, for example, 4.6 million population, there is a 1.4 million car. Where do we go with that? It's like uh, one car for every three person. So in, area, in, uh, in the rural area like in Africa, the, where there's no, even there's no public buses, there's only bus transportation from the big city to those city, people will always use their car. Just name it, you might come with a scooter or whatever, no customer. People will use their own personal car. But once you get closer to the city, where you have cities like uh, uh, Nigeria, which is like a 21 million population, definitely mobility solution is a must. But, but there, for example, you can use the digital tools that we have today to create a specific uh, bus system uh, for the countryside or for low dense uh, areas. You can, for example, create a bus on demand that runs very different uh, depending on uh, if it is in the peak hour or, or in the, during the day. Uh, for example, we will now introduce in Luxembourg uh, uh, in a year a bus on demand system for rural areas that will be really managed by, by digital tools. Today we have these possibilities that we hadn't years ago. So you, really, it's a question about having a vision. If it is, for, no matter if it is for rural areas or for urban areas, it's always to, to question yourself, what is the combinations that I can do uh, to really uh, put in place a system that, it, that really is then the best system for the population that I have there? If, if you'll just allow me to respond to you on that, because I, I find it very interesting that there are more solutions than what we're using. On the other hand, with the increase of technology, our frontier for waiting for things, for being patient, is much and much more decreased. So mobility for some people may mean having a bus in two minutes or five minutes, whereas even if you have a wonderful technological system app to uh, use demand in the rural areas, you may have to wait a half an hour or 45 but, but minutes. But to, today, the, the individual mobility that we have today in the urban areas Sorry, in the morning, in the peak hours, you are stuck in your car for hours. Absolutely. So that's not, a car had not been built <laughs> to, run on, to run by five kilometers an hour. Uh, but normally the, 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 the average speed in, in the peak hours is between 10 and 15 kilometers per hour. You nearly can walk. You know? So we must think about this, how we organize this mobility. The car, you have a car, for example, with, with a horse force inside your car, uh, you could really, uh, it, it's good, no, 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 normally you, you could transport, I don't know, elephants with this, but in the car there's one people and it's stuck in the morning in, in the traffic jam. So that's the inefficiency that we organized in the last 30, 40, 50 years, and that's we must rethink. 
Absolutely. I think uh, we need to end on this because I see that our time is over. Um, if you would just uh, allow me to, again, thank our guests who are here with us today. I, I want to say personally, I appreciate your optimism. Um, I'm looking forward to watching your cities and your new inventions. And please join me in thanking all our guests who have been with us. <laughs>